It was the largest man-made explosion until atomic weapons. A lot of people came to their windows of their homes to watch the fire, not knowing how dangerous the fire was. 9,000 injured, 1,500 killed instantly. He lost a wife, three children, and a baby to be born in the spring. Total destruction for half a mile radius. Hospitals were just crowded with injured people. A city facing the challenge of a generation. Something as major as this had happened, and very little notice seemed to have been taken of it. These people, their lives changed in a flash. The Halifax Explosion. On the morning of December 6, 1917, at the height of the First World War, two ships steamed toward each other in the Halifax Harbor. The Mont Blanc, loaded with munitions for the French military, was entering the harbor, while the Belgian ship, Emo, was steaming outbound. Halifax was the center for convoys gathering to sail for Europe. So on this morning, her harbor was filled with ships. On shore in the bustling port, people were beginning their day. The city was a hive of wartime activity and was filled with soldiers, sailors, and civilians. In the waterfront neighborhood of Richmond, residents were on their way to work and children were settling into their classrooms. As the Emo steamed out of the harbor, an American ship was making her way in. In order to stay out of the way, the Emo moved off course into the wrong shipping lane. At the same time, the Mont Blanc was entering the harbor. Her deadly cargo included 2,300 tons of picric acid, 200 tons of TNT, 10 tons of gun cotton, and 35 tons of benzol. Normally, munition ships fly red flags to warn other ships. But since this was wartime and German spies could be anywhere, no flag was flown. The two ships were on a collision course. Twice, the Mont Blanc signaled to the Emo to move to its correct lane. In a last-ditch effort to avoid a collision, the Emo reversed her engines. This caused her bow to swing to the right, striking the Mont Blanc. Sparks ignited the benzol barrels on deck. The burning Mont Blanc began to drift near Pier 6 in the narrowest part of the harbor. Directly above, the residents of Richmond were drawn to the excitement. As the ship burned, explosives shot up like fireworks, attracting the attention of everyone on the waterfront. In the streets above, the residents of Richmond had front row views to the spectacle. For so many, the end was only moments away. A few seconds before 9.05 a.m., the Mont Blanc disappeared in a flash of pure energy. Blast had the equivalent force of 2.9 kilotons of TNT. The barrel of one gun was catapulted three and a half miles away. <laughs> 
and part of her anchor was thrown more than two miles. The blast was felt in Cape Breton, more than 270 miles away. As the mushroom cloud cleared, the devastation was revealed. Pier 6 was decimated. Surrounding homes were leveled. The entire neighborhood of Richmond was flattened. Large buildings like the Acadia Sugar Refinery, the Hillis Foundry, and the Railway Depot were obliterated. So too was the Richmond School. In the harbor, the concussion from the blast created a tidal wave that swept the emo to the opposite shore. Oily black rain from the explosion fell down, blackening everything it touched. Flattened houses caught fire, fatally trapping those not killed instantly. As the smoke cleared, the toll of the explosion was revealed. 2,000 people were killed, and more than 9,000 others were horribly wounded. Flying glass was the main killer, and eye injuries were beyond anything doctors had ever seen. The Halifax Explosion will return. And now, back to the Halifax Explosion. Minutes after the massive blast that became known as the Halifax Explosion on the morning of December 6, 1917, cries from the wounded trapped in burning debris filled the air. It was a scene of carnage. Hospitals were soon overflowing as the wounded began to stream in. Many people whose eyes were destroyed died from brain and internal injuries. The lucky ones survived, but would go sightless the rest of their lives. Dr. Thomas J. Murray, former dean of the Dalhousie Medical School, has given many lectures on the medical repercussions of the explosion. Like so many others in Halifax, he has a personal connection to that day. I became interested for a couple of reasons. One was my mother-in-law had lived through the explosion and she had glass uh, which had to be removed from her scalp and from her forehead. And she had a door at her school in the North End collapse on her. And so I had this personal story in the family of someone who had gone through this. My grandparents were living here at the time, and they had a very large family. And he was an optometrist, so he became very involved in the eye story. The other thing, as a physician, interested in the history of medicine. I was interested in the stories that I heard that when the explosion occurred shortly after, people knew where to go. And I wondered how that got organized. How did they know that the doctor was in that school auditorium or was um, in another uh, community hall or whatever? How did that get organized? And there wasn't a record of how that occurred. And so I became interested in how things became so well organized. Dr. Murray studied accounts of how hospitals coped in the first few hours after the explosion. We know that most of the local physicians, for instance, began to take care of people, and they cared for them for the next 48 hours, usually with no sleep. And many of the people around them who were volunteering to assist the nurses and the aides and the medical students also had no rest during this period. And you can imagine the hospitals were just crowded with injured people to be managed. They had to be assessed and they cared for. The operating rooms were continually running and the physicians had no time to take rest, even to have a meal. Over time, most wounds would heal, but for those who had been watching the burning Mont Blanc from their windows, life would never be the same again. Many of the people who had the glass come in on their face had serious injuries to their eyes. It was not a difficult thing to manage taking glass out of the skin or forehead or whatever. They had to decide if an eye was injured, if they could remove glass and if they could save the eye. 
if they couldn't, and it obviously had been so damaged that it was, they had to remove the eye. And in some cases, of course, some people had both eyes removed and so were then totally blind. I think that some of them could have had the eyes saved, but at that time, it was a matter of making a decision about whether or not this was retrievable. And you have to also remember, there are not very many eye specialists at the time. And some of them that did come from Montreal and elsewhere only came many days later. So most of the things that had to be cared for had to be cared for in the first 24 hours. And during that time, there were only the local physicians involved. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. Dr. W.B. Moore, who came from the nearby town of Kentville to help, described what he saw in a letter he wrote to the Halifax Disaster Record Office. Men, women, and children of all sorts and classes were literally packed in the ward like sardines. The ghastly appearance of so many following the hemorrhage from innumerable glass wounds, disfiguring faces and destroying eyes, was really trying to the most experienced and strongest nerves. And some of the men who had been at the front in the war declared they had never witnessed anything so terrible. Many people were horribly burned by widespread fires. Eric Davidson was watching the Mont Blanc from his family's dining room window. My name is Marilyn Elliott. Um, my father, Eric Davidson, was blinded in the Halifax explosion. The morning of the explosion, my father and his uh, older sister and his mother were in the kitchen. He was two and a half years old, and they were looking out the window, as many uh, in Richmond were doing at that time, and they were watching a, f a ship burn in the harbour. And um, my aunt and my grandmother turned away from the window just at the time of the explosion, but unfortunately, Dad was still looking out the window. The window came in upon him, and the glass shattered, of course, and he had glass all over his face, his neck, his upper body, and he was blinded. Dad was too young to remember anything of the morning, which is probably a good thing because the trauma of it all. He did remember going back with his father in the following months and years to examine the ruins, in particular Richmond School. In a National Film Board vignette about Eric Davidson, he recalls being brought to visit his devastated neighborhood. One of the first things I can remember after the explosion, of course, I suppose I was <clears> out <throat> of the hospital. Uh, it must have been perhaps when I was three years old or more, and my father was showing me the debris that was laying around the north end. It was still around there at that time, you know, because that was only in the next spring. And uh, he showed me the, all the lumber and the houses that were blown down, the wreckage, you know. Another young Richmond child named Millicent Swindells lost the sight in one eye the morning of the explosion. And if it wasn't for the quick thinking of her father, she and her brother Archie would have lost their lives. Her daughter, Anne Ehas, knows the story well. My mother <coughs> was upstairs in the, on, the, on the top floor. My grandfather, her father, had just come home from doing the night shift on the railroad and was going to bed for the day. But um, my mother had a bilious attack, or we would call it a migraine now, I would think, and her, her brother was just at home. And uh, so he, um, they said, oh, look at the fire in the harbor. And of course, everybody was drawn to the windows. And my mother, um, she lost an eye. And so she, he, he thought of taking the uh, 
the square of oilcloth, which would be a rug for us today, and um, making a chute and sending the children down. My mother, Millicent, and my uncle, Arch. And he said, stay there until I come down. And when he went back to see about his family that were on the main floor, when he went back, the house was engulfed and he heard no sounds. So he lost a wife and three children and a baby to be born in the spring. Anne's father also lived in the Richmond neighborhood. His survival that morning was no less miraculous. Well, he was Wilbert Earl Swindells, but he was called Bill. And uh, he was older than my mother, not by much. And uh, he was late for school. So uh, by this time, I guess, or at some point, the soldiers were on duty and they found him and he had a dreadful cut in his face and they just took him, packed it with flour. So really he was scarred. While residents of North End Halifax began to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives, for newly blinded survivors like Eric Davidson and Millicent Swindells, the journey to recovery was just beginning. For the survivors of the Halifax explosion who were blinded by shattered glass, daily life would never be the same again. Jane Beaumont is a volunteer archivist for the Canadian National Institute for the Blind in Ottawa. She has researched the Halifax explosion extensively. There were about a thousand people who had an eye injury of some kind. Now, many others probably did, but died from other injuries. And one of the strange things about the, the explosion was that a lot of people came to their windows of their homes to watch the fire, not knowing how dangerous the fire was on, that, on the Mont Blanc. And it was another 25 minutes before the explosion happened. So in the end, about 250 people lost an eye and 37 women were blinded completely. There were about five or six children and there were about five men. These people, their lives changed in a flash, an instant. First they had to be rescued, they're taken to the hospital, and they're blind, and they have no idea what that's going to mean for the rest of their lives. Prior to the explosion, Halifax physicians had become used to treating soldiers blinded, fighting in the First World War. There was also an established school for the blind in the city, run by Sir Frederick Fraser. These two factors meant the city was uniquely positioned to help those newly blinded. Nova Scotia was a leader in, in Canada in care for the blind because the Halifax School for the Blind had actually been founded in 1867, was the first school in Canada. And in 1882, the Nova Scotia legislature passed an act which decreed that people with vision loss must be educated. So they got free education um, because of that act. And there was a child called Frederick Fraser, who when he was seven had an accident and lost the sight in one eye and eventually lost all his sight. And his father was a doctor in the valley and sent him to a school, the Perkins School in Boston. And by the time Frederick Fraser graduated, he'd lost all his sight. And he graduated, I think in 1872. And by 1873, he's the head of the Halifax School for the Blind and he spent 50 years there. So it, there was this continuity right from the start through Frederick Fraser. And he was an amazing person from what I've been reading and seeing. So that's, that's the story of the leadership for sure. I would say within two or three days, he was getting an, a notice in the newspaper asking people who were blinded to register with the School for the Blind. Um, he recognized that the, um, they would have a special role to play in helping people who had been blinded. Halifax was incredibly lucky to have Sir Frederick Fraser um, taking a lead in the Halifax School for the Blind. It's one of those amazing coincidences that made such a difference. Um, he, he is a huge hero to me. I'm really impressed by him. For adults blinded in the explosion, simple daily tasks had to be relearned. 
a mother has now got to learn how to look after her children. Even personal grooming is very different if you're blind. Um, she's got to learn to cook, to sew, to clean, all of those things capable of doing, but you do them in different ways if you're blind. So that was the sort of thing that the school started, immediately took on adults and started to teach them things like that. In the past, there had not been adults at the school. It was intended for education. Um, and then they, once they'd learned to look after them, themselves and their homes, they got to navigate the city again and be able to move around. And we call that orientation and mobility today. But those people would need those skills to get to the shops, to do whatever they needed to continue daily life. Today, technological advances have opened up a world of employment opportunities that didn't exist for those living with vision loss back in 1917. The other thing that's really changed is technology. And if you think about back then, like I said, they wrote letters backwards and forwards and occasionally sent a telegram. So there was nothing like the communication that we have now. And then four people with vision loss, smartphones, screen readers, being able to zoom the text on the screen, all of those things are just transforming people's lives and making it possible for them to work in the mainstream employment. Societal attitudes towards the blind back in 1917 were also far different than attitudes today. People who were blinded, there were stigmas. Really, it was more to do with the attitude was that if you're disabled, you can't do anything, and we'd better look after you. So it was very, I, I, like, I have to use the word patriarchal and protective. And CNIB was like that as well as the people probably working at the Relief Commission and the school. And it was, it was simply a, that they didn't expect people to do things beyond basic living for themselves. And so if they were going to be economically independent, people had to be taught a new skill that was possible to do if you were blind. The combination of soldiers blinded in the First World War and the explosion in Halifax meant the city needed new facilities and training now more than ever before. There was a real need for a national institution that would be support the people with blind people with vision loss and blinded and provide training and what we call rehabilitation. So really the explosion was one more incident in addition to the war which caused there to be a, a critical mass of people who needed help and needed services. Certainly the Halifax explosion had a major impact in the impetus to get CNIB organized. I would say it was almost there when the explosion happened, but this was just the final thing that said, we've got to get on with this. The fact that Nova Scotia was a leader in looking after blind people meant that the help was right here. I can't quite imagine what would have happened if the explosion had been in some other part of the country where there was no real support for people with vision loss at the time. Blinded victims of the explosion not only had daily tasks to relearn, there were obvious physical changes as well, as Dr. Thomas J. Murray explains. If you had an eye removed after the explosion, after the healing had occurred, and there was no infection or any other change that required further treatment, uh, then you would be fitted for a glass eye. And if you had one eye that had perhaps been damaged but it was saved, they would match it to that eye. And so there was an opportunity then to have people looking reasonably normal because you matched the eyes to be perfect. And you can see here we have some trays of glass eyes that came from that period. Although they look very natural as an eye, but the shape of these if we turn one over, you'll notice that they're hollow underneath, like a cup. And they fit it in the eye in that fashion, rather than a globe, which most people would think of. Uh, but these would be fitted so that they had a very natural appearance. They're made of glass, and there were firms at the time that would hand make the eye. Even though it's done in glass, they would paint the little blood vessels on them, and then they would be glazed afterwards. And they also make the iris and the pupil, so the eye looks very natural. Well, I think there are a couple of reasons why the eye injury captivates people. 
One is that you can have an injury to many parts of your body and it doesn't make much difference in how you see yourself. But the world and how it is mirrored to you is through your eyes. So most people have a very sensitive view of the importance of their eyes. And so I think that's one aspect. The other aspect is it was one of the one of the few serious injuries. If you weren't killed, there were only a few things that tended to happen to people that were that serious, and one of them was the eyes. And so I think eye injuries were a particularly important aspect of the explosion, just by the nature of how it happened. People think that the ships collided and things blew up, but actually, they collided and then burned for a long time with black smoke from the picric acid. And so people were looking out their windows at these burning ships in the harbor. And that's why so many people were by windows uh, when the explosion happened. The Halifax explosion will return. And now back to the Halifax explosion. For survivors of the Halifax explosion, like Marilyn Elliott's father, Eric Davidson, Halifax's School for the Blind became an important lifeline. Dad went to school at the School for the Blind in Halifax, and he went there from 1922, he started when he was seven, until 1932. It was a happy time for him. He only spoke about it as a happy time. There was never any regrets for going there. He, he uh, praised the school for giving him the ability to live an independent life. Eric Davidson was one of Halifax's most recognizable survivors of the explosion. It was something his daughter Marilyn says he could never quite understand. He really didn't understand what everyone was fussing about. He was injured in the explosion and he recognized that of the survivors in later years, he was the only one who had a visible injury that, that you know, people could identify with. One of the reasons that made Eric Davidson so well known was because he worked for years for the city of Halifax as a mechanic. His daughter Marilyn explains how he learned about cars without ever seeing one. He bought a 1925 Chev. He had that Chev in the backyard and he took it apart and put it back together again with the assistance of his brothers who read auto manuals to him. So they would read the manuals to him about a particular thing, let's say spark plugs, and then he'd go to the car in the backyard and he'd take the spark plugs out, clean them, put them back in, and he did these things over and over and over and they, they were good to read to him over and over and over. and. Uh, he eventually was, was able to get that car running and, and many after that, and, and of course that steered him in, into his career. In the National Film Board short film, Just One of the Boys, Eric explained how he worked without sight. Working on an engine boy, if I was a, uh, had the cover off and was adjusting the valves while the car was running, I'd have to go by feel, and so would you, if you were doing the same thing, you see. If uh, you were testing compression, why, you would have to look at it, well, so would I, but I can't, I have a compression gauge of my own that I can feel, it's just like the hands of a clock, and a vacuum gauge, but I don't have a timing light. Pretty hard to feel a light. Eric was also known for taking the occasional turn at the steering wheel. It's a story his daughter Marilyn tells often. When he got the opportunity, he certainly did drive a vehicle, but it was usually on places like Clam Harbor Beach was a, a favorite for them, or a deserted back road. And this happened a lot when in the 30s and 40s, when he would be with his brothers mostly, and they were driving on dirt roads. So there wasn't a lot of people or traffic around, so it was safe to do so. Eric met his future wife, Mary Zink, at a bowling league for the blind. The two got married and had three children. We knew our parents were visually impaired, but our dad went to work like the other fathers. Our mother stayed at home and looked after us like the other mothers. So we really didn't feel like we were any different or that they were any different. The only differences were uh, we had to be 
as children of visually impaired uh, parents, we helped our parents a lot more than our friends had to help their parents. Uh, we didn't leave our toys lying around like, like sighted children with sighted parents would do, maybe. Those things, those little idiosyncrasies. My parents, they had done so much more with so much less than other parents. My brothers and I always felt that we were lucky to have them for parents, yeah. Ann Ehaas's mother, Millicent, was also a graduate of the Halifax School for the Blind. She got all of her schooling there right up to grade 12. And she had some lifelong friends from that schooling. She went on to take a hairdressing course, went to Montreal for that, and then um, came back and continued on in her life. Although her mother would occasionally speak to school children about the explosion, Anne says it was a subject that was rarely talked about at home. There's a lot of things that we should have asked and we should know. And it's at times like this that you think, oh, I should have said that or I should have asked. They didn't really sit down and talk about it. It just came in conversation with whoever you might be with. So I guess we picked up a lot of that. Anne's daughter, Anne Louise, grew up knowing her grandparents were explosion survivors, but says details of that terrible day were not a topic of discussion. As a mother myself uh, of two children, I can't imagine what that family went through uh, that after that explosion in the sense of uh, they lost my, gran my grandmother, lost a mother and my great-grandfather lost his wife they lost siblings and uh and children and it must have been devastating for for them it had to have been devastating for them and i think today looking back i i think there was probably a strong element of post-traumatic stress syndrome when you just see you know the silence not talking about it just like I just couldn't imagine that loss, dealing with that loss. The stories of many Halifax explosion survivors might have disappeared had it not been for the work of author and historian Janet Kitts. Over the course of writing her books, Shattered City and Survivors, she became a confidant for many survivors. It is something that Eric Davidson's daughter, Marilyn Elliott, is thankful for. For years there had been no, no one was interested in the survivors or the explosion. Um, so it was, it was kind of a dead issue. And once Janet started to draw out the survivors uh, with their stories, they felt like, well, really, somebody wants to hear about this. Isn't, isn't that a change? Anne Ehaas is also grateful to the author for bringing the story of both her parents' survival to light. She brought it to life and brought a, thing, a lot of things that we didn't know and discovered people that we didn't, that they didn't know. Janet just seemed to be the person that you turned to and she was totally, totally involved. For Janet, getting to know the survivors was more than just research. Well, it was a great human tragedy. Meeting the survivors to begin with, I found very moving indeed, and very interesting, not just moving. I mean, there was nothing sentimental about it. It was the fact that something as major as this had happened, and very little notice seemed to have been taken of it. That all contributed. But I just became more interested the more I found out. I knew Eric quite well. He was amazing. He had accepted his blindness with such a degree. He walked all over the city and he would say, he would say something to him and he would say, I see, I see. I remember taking him to the park, to Point Pleasant Park one day for a walk. And you know, he knew exactly where we were. He had a tremendous sense of direction and he coped so well. So Millicent was partially sighted. She was at the School for the Blind, though, because there was always a worry 
that she might lose what vision she had. In her writing, Janet acknowledges the particular difficulties blinded survivors would have faced. I think while they were still in hospital, they were being very, very well looked after and a lot of fuss and attention was made. Then after they got home, volunteers tried hard. They took them to appointments. They did what they could to help. But can you imagine trying to run a house that you had always run successfully and then not be able to see anymore? It was very, very difficult. One or two men were reported as being very depressed, but it was mainly women. They didn't know how to cope with the ordinary way of life in a house. And some of them, there were reports of husbands being a little bit unkind sometimes. Four months after the explosion, the Halifax Relief Commission hired an American couple trained in social work to help with blind survivors. In her book, Shattered City, Janet Kitts writes about their impact. If the couple came from New York, who had specialized in treatment for the blind, Murphy, they were called, he was partially sighted himself, and she had been doing work, rehabilitation for the blind, in New York. They brought a wonderful common sense attitude with them and were able to train the women to cook, to clean, to use braille alphabet. One woman was reported as, as having said, I didn't like to read when I could see, so you know, not making much difference now. But they did, and they had braille books brought up, brought in, and did a great deal of retraining of the blinded. The Halifax Explosion will return and now, back to the Halifax Explosion. Today, there are few physical reminders of the Halifax Explosion in the neighborhood of Richmond. The Needham Hill Monument overlooks the once devastated community. And every year, on December 6th, a memorial service is held here. And welcome to Fort Needham Park for the ceremony to commemorate the anniversary of the Halifax explosion. At the exact site of the blast at Pier 6, a new shipyard now sits on top of where so many died. At the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic in downtown Halifax, there is a permanent exhibit showcasing artifacts gathered from burned out homes and mortuary effects that were found on the dead. Despite the fact the explosion is still the worst disaster in Canadian history, many people in this country and abroad know little or nothing about it. It's something the museum's curator, Dr. Roger Marsters, hears often. Very frequently we hear comments from visitors who are coming from outside the region who have never heard of the explosion before. And that's always quite startling because it does play such a, 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 an important role in the historical memory of Nova Scotia itself. Because of the sort of demographic strength of central Canada, people tend to think of Canada as a, as a continental nation, as an inland nation. And as a result, I think maritime disasters, disasters related to the sea, are, are more difficult to uh, assimilate and to understand in the Canadian consciousness. It's, it's harder to see that as part of the Canadian identity. Author and historian Janet Kitts thinks the story of the Halifax explosion might be more well-known if its victims had not been from a solely working-class neighborhood. If the ships had collided, say, near the ferry wharf, then the damage would have affected City Hall, all the offices along in the south, in central Halifax, the people who were killed would have been perhaps better known. I think that would have made a difference. But supposing, for example, the mayor had been killed. Supposing City Hall had been blown up. Some of the office buildings, some of the legal offices in the center, that might have made a big difference. Marilyn Elliott wishes the events and stories surrounding the explosion were known more as well. Part of me is disappointed that it 
it, it became forgotten. The Halifax explosion and, and the tragedy uh, following it were forgotten, but we have to think too that it, back in 1917, 1918, that's the way people dealt with things. They, they didn't talk about it. There wasn't an encouragement to get it off your chest, to talk about it, to purge, and maybe you will feel better. Um, my grandmother suffered from what we know now as PTSD. She had no one to go to. Nobody had anyone to go to. The only physical connection to the stories of the victims and survivors of the Halifax explosion are at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. For curator Dr. Roger Marsters, these artifacts are crucial in bringing the tragedy to life. Many of the artifacts are mortuary artifacts. They were collected in the immediate aftermath of the explosion itself by the officials who were involved in the relief efforts. Others were collected throughout the 20th century and brought into the Nova Scotia Museum collection piece by piece. Others were donated by family members, and we still regularly receive new accessions of interesting material related to the explosion. For me, I think the uh, Mont Blanc vessel fragments uh, speak most eloquently of the power of the explosion. These are huge, heavy pieces of steel, marine castings that have just been twisted into pretzel-like shapes by the force of the blast, and they really convey a sense of the, the power of the blast uh, and its effects on the city. Many of the items have been donated by families who suffered tragic losses in the explosion. Found items include everyday things like keys, wallets, and jewelry. For Anne Ehaas, it is important to share a glimpse of what her family's life was like the morning of the explosion. My grandfather's nightgown is hanging there. It was washed and washed and washed, but the oil or whatever got into it was never able to be come out. And then there was the doll dishes, my mother's doll dishes. I'm holding uh, pennies that were in the children's piggy banks. They've melted together, and there is a single one, but most of them melted together. For Marilyn Elliott, the portrait of her father Eric Davidson on display at the explosion exhibit is a point of pride. Including stories about the blind experience in the exhibit is crucial to curator Dr. Roger Marsters. Well, I think the, uh, the, the blind experience of the Halifax explosion really does speak to the extent of the trauma, the sheer force of the blast as it impacted individual lives in terms of the sort of extent and severity of the uh, injuries resulting from the explosion, but also the resilience of the people involved as well. People who did suffer um, very serious injuries, but who nevertheless were able to live productive and inspiring lives. A century after the horror of the explosion, it is hard to imagine how difficult life for blinded survivors would have been. It is something that Canadian National Institute for the Blind archivist, Jane Beaumont, can't help but think about. When we talk about people going outside, going out and, and navigating the city, I try to imagine what it might be like for a recently blinded person to walk down the street they knew incredibly well and there would be damaged houses, there would be great big pieces of house and, and debris all over the street. It must have been terrifying. In spite of the trauma, the stories experienced by blind survivors, stories like that of Eric Davidson continue to inspire, something his daughter Marilyn Elliott is proud of. He tried to live his life like any other person with sight would live their life. He enjoyed doing anything that a sighted person would do, skating, swimming. He particularly enjoyed the sounds of nature, like the peepers in the spring, the little frogs, and he liked the sound of the foghorn down in the uh, harbor, uh, and he often recorded those sounds. Um, he enjoyed us children growing up. He loved to listen to us play. He enjoyed playing banjo, which he did a lot. He just had a positive attitude. 
and he wasn't going to be labeled by his blindness. And because of that, I would say the majority of his friends were, were sighted people. Everyone liked to be around Dad because you didn't feel he was handicapped. He never took no for an answer. He didn't give up. He had the most wonderful positive attitude and it took him through life. 100 years after the explosion, ensuring that the stories of suffering, heroism, and triumph are shared to a wider audience will be what matters most. Executive producer, Johanna Elliott. Writer and director, Jennifer Adcock. Production manager, Jennifer Camo. Director of photography, Mark Hammond. Editor, Jake Harris. Narrator, Jamie Patterson. Online editor, Kenneth Peterson. Sound editor and mixer, Neil Gadette. Integrated described video consultant, Simone Cupid. Development and production executive, Andrew Morris. Ocean Entertainment, copyright 2017. An AMI original production.